in a larger sense, are you English? Are you Canadian? Are you North American? And I don't mean in passport sense. I mean in oh, I'm, I'm, the I'm set from which you now come from. So oh, to I'm speak. extremely Canadian. I'm, um, I discovered where I wanted to be. It was wonderful when I. Um, what does it, that mean? Well, it means, luckily for us, it means that we had a choice which many people didn't. I mean, I, I was born, my mother is Welsh, I was born, my father's from Yorkshire, I was born in Kent, so in England I wasn't like a rooted person. Uh, I was always, we had family and a bit in Australia, we always told there was somebody in Brazil, so I, I felt, I, I, I loved English things, British things, but I wanted to go someplace else. I was the archetypal colonial settler, is what I am. Um, and in fact, the kind of school that I went to in England trained people to be, well, you know, minor district officers in Upper Nigeria for the old empire. But of course, when I came out of school, the empire had gone, so there wasn't any call for it. So as I say, <laughs> say to people, you know, I ended up in the theater. Um, but I, the States, when I arrived, was totally exciting to me because it was movies. One had been brought up in the late 40s, early 50s on movies, you know? And so I could see what it was about, this, this fantastic country. And I didn't know very much about Canada, but in 19... I mean, 1959, I drove my old car, I bought a car, 1949 Dodge, uh, and I drove it to Vancouver. And um, I'd written to the Vancouver Festival that I spoke about earlier and said, I am a student at the University of Illinois, can I have a job? And they wrote back and said, don't be ridiculous, you know, there aren't any jobs and any jobs there might be, we'll give to Vancouver people. So I disregarded this and got in the car and drove to Vancouver and ended up in the office and said, you wrote me a letter saying that you couldn't have a job, but I thought that didn't really mean anything, so I've arrived. <laughs> he stared at me and the guy who was the general manager, I've forgotten what his name was, called up the university and called up a man called Dr. Friesen, who ran the external, uh, external division, you know, going out and teaching, and said, well, I've got a chap here, have you got a job for him? And I got paid $50 a week writing the uh, the annual report of the external vision of UBC that year. Uh, they gave me an office and a typewriter and I'd type away and I realized I'd, I was going to get this job done in two weeks. So I, I invented other jobs and they went along with it. And, um, I loved Vancouver. That was the start of my Canadian experience. I just thought it was incredible. And I realized that it was a, almost a clean slate as a country, I remember asking people in Vancouver, who's written about Vancouver? Um, I read a review of Midsummer Night's Dream at Stratford, our Stratford, and I remember one, one sentence in Time magazine of this review, which said that Diana Maddox pushed the, pushed the cobwebs away from her face as she moved through the forest. And I thought, that's fantastic. That's theatre. That's what I'm interested in. I didn't know why I was interested in that, but I knew that was magical. And of course it connects with what I end up completely believing in, the mm -hmm. reality of the thing. You must create a, a parallel reality in the theatre. You must be rooted in the moment. And that's a, that's a recognisable thing, that you push cobwebs away in the dark as you're moving through trees. And I thought, this is fantastic. That's the theatre I want to work in. If I work in a theatre, because I didn't want to go into New York, I didn't, I didn't know what to do in New York yet. I have an agent. I didn't know what agents were, so I thought, I'll audition for Stratford. So I wrote to them and they said, yes, you can have an audition. <laughs> so I'd had the summer in, um, in Oregon and I got on the train. I went up to Vancouver, uh, got on the train, went across the country and... Um, well, there what happened to the car? Oh, I sold the car. I sold the car in order to pay for the, my trip across the country on the train. <laughs> um, that was funny in itself. Do you want to hear a funny story yeah. about that one? It's, um, I got on the train and I was so excited. <laughs> and I... Uh, I got the cheapest first class ticket, which was an upper berth, you know, uh, but it gave me meals. 
say, in Vancouver, and I go down to the dining car for dinner first thing. So, and there are people joining you at the table, and I said, uh, they said, hello, and I said, I'm an actor. You know, I'm an actor. <laughs> out of work, the university professor. Uh, I, I'm an actor. I have an audition for Stratford. <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, that's very interesting, you know, as people do. Uh, I'm looking very wet behind the ears, and I looked younger than I was, I think. And I said, yes, it's on Thursday. Oh, you know, we get in on Wednesday, and I'll be able to go down to Stratford. And they said, oh, no, no, this train gets into Toronto on Thursday. I said, no, no, you get in on Wednesday, because I've worked all this out. I said, I think you're wrong. <laughs> so I rushed down, and I find the conductor, and I said, when does this train get into, uh, into Toronto? And he said, I don't know, I get off at Regina. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, wait a minute, let me look. It's being funny. He said, oh, it gets in on Thursday. I said, oh my God, I'm on the wrong train. Um, <laughs> so he said, well, I'll tell you what to do. Get off at Calgary and tell them your predicament. So I did. I got off at Calgary when we stopped at Calgary. And, uh, and I went into the station. I went to, you know, customer service or whatever it was in the old station, the CPR station in, in Calgary. And I said, look, this has happened. And I got this audition at Stratford. I'm an actor. I have to get there. And they said, oh, we'll, we'll deal with that. Um, We'll have a car waiting for you in Winnipeg. We'll take you out to the airport. There's a flight at so and so and so and so, and you'll get into Toronto at this. So I arrived in Winnipeg. There was a car waiting for me at uh, the station that took me out to the Winnipeg airport. I got on a CP flight and arrived in Toronto you know, a couple of hours later, and I got money back. It was amazing. Oh my God! I know. Which paid then for the train to go down to Stratford, where I was turned down on the spot by uh, Michael Langham, who said that we don't want any more Americans. I'm afraid, and I, I was so nervous I couldn't say, "Well, I'm not an American. I'm not anything really. I'm just a person wanting to be an actor." It was kind of displaced. Um, Why did he think you were American? Well, because I'd written from the States oh, and he got my letter. You but know. the sound that came out of your mouth. Well, that didn't matter in those days. Uh, people didn't recognize American accents in 1961, for instance, here. I, I would talk to people and say, well, that person's got an American accent. And they'd say, what? What do you mean, American accent? There was no recognition in 1961 that, the, that Canadians spoke any differently from Americans. Now, I had an ear for it. I can't actually reproduce accents very well myself, but I have an ear for it because I was trained with a man called Harold Orton at Leeds in the English language department who was a the great phoneticist and the, the man who established the dialect atlas, and uh, he would he would listen to people and go, "Oh, your mother's, you know, from the border country, and your father's this, mm -hmm. and you were brought up in Dumfries." And he could do that just like Higgins. So I, you listen and you hear, but in the early '60s, people in this country could not recognize. And do that. you think that's a cultural thing? Yes, I think it's an awareness. That the culture wasn't tuned to yes, those right. kind of differences. Yes, it was uh, still in the 60s. With so many Canadians, so many Canadians, not necessarily the ones who were pushing, like Maver and people like that, still thought themselves as kind of poor cousins of people in the States. There's still an element of that going mm -hmm. on, you know? Um, it's remarkable the way it's changed, though. Oh, it's wonderful, because yeah. I talk about myself as having been so lucky in that I saw this, this renaissance, if you like. If you think back to 1867, there was a real need to create this different version of a North American culture, if you like. And then that kind of disappeared. It, it, it hadn't, we'd been, firstly, we'd, been, we'd always been a kind of colonial power, it seemed to me, first the French, then the British. And then after the British kind of waned between the wars, it was the Americans, and they're extremely powerful. We thought of ourselves as a kind of branch plant. But I, I didn't, you see. I thought, wow, this is another, what I saw was a, a, an opportunity to reflect this world. It's like Toronto. I, I ended up in Toronto after Stratford being turned down, and I had to go around everywhere that, which hired actors. That's four places in 1961. That was the CBC, that was the Crest, that was Canadian Players, and I think the Village Playhouse or something. And I even went to see that dear man, uh, what was his name, Guy Gatorell at the oh Opera Company. God. 
and lied through my teeth, you know, oh yes. That you could sing? No, 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 that I've been assisting, you know, people in opera productions in Denmark. Where, he said. I've never even been to Denmark. You know, I was just so stupid, I was getting desperate. Uh, And I directed one opera at university, so I thought, well, I can set an opera director. 